I'm Pastor Dick Stadler, and I'm here again with Ann Carter and with Father Chuck Carter, and we're here talking Sunday readings. And we're talking the readings for this Sunday for the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, and we'd like to share with you a discussion of Ezekiel 34, verses 11 to 16, and verses 20 to 24, which many people are going to hear in their churches. And then we're going to do 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28. And then in the, the gospel reading, we're going to do Matthew 25, 31 to 46. So let's begin with the um, Old Testament lesson in Ezekiel 34. A reading from Ezekiel. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you shove with flank and shoulder, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away, I will save my flock, and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Uh, let's remind ourselves um, when Ezekiel was writing. Ezekiel tells us in the very first verse of the first chapter of his book, that he is sitting with the exiles on the Kibar River, which is in Babylon. So he is one of the exiles who was taken to Babylon during the different exiles that took place before the final destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. And during this uh, sitting there, uh, he sees around himself the languishing of the Israelites. And we also see that if he was with the earliest uh, evacuation of Jerusalem, that people are still carrying on in Jerusalem before the final destruction um, in ways that are very displeasing to God. And so he has a lot of discussion in the earlier chapters about all the idolatry that caused this exile to take place. But he also offers them some wonderful um, good news, that there's a restoration coming and there'll be an end to the exile for those that are willing to take advantage of it. And that does occur in um, 539 BC, when Cyrus the Persian issues an edict of toleration and allows any Jews that are in the kingdom that wanna go back to Jerusalem to go back and rebuild their temple and to um, rebuild the city. And um, here before that, you've got the uh, prophecy of, of Ezekiel. And here in Ezekiel 34, uh, he starts out by saying, thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. So this is going to be a promise of God's restoration for his scattered sheep. Uh, the first scattering took place in 722 BC when the Assyrian Empire conquered the 10 northern tribes called Israel and scattered them throughout the Assyrian Empire. 
And then this next big uh, scattering diaspora took place when Babylon crushed Jerusalem and crushed Israel in 586. And now what Ezekiel is going to say in this verse, and you can look for, in these verses for all these promises of good things that are going to be restored and all the good things that are going to be happening and reasons why people have a reason to um, worship God, thank God, praise God, and to rejoice. And in, if you look toward the end of this reading, there's some wonderful passages in verse 22. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. So this is not just a prophecy about a historical regathering of Israel in Jerusalem when they have that opportunity to do that. This is a pointing toward the Messiah because David is dead. And so if he's going to have a servant, David, who is going to be shepherding the sheep of God, then we're talking about the Messiah. And this is talking about Jesus. And so this is a wonderful prophecy toward the end of the church year as we're talking about the return of Christ. And a lot of the readings anticipate the judgment day and when Christ will be the judge. And you'll see that again in the gospel reading uh, today. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful um, Christ-centered prophecy. And so you can look for that as you listen for this reading or listen to this reading. Anything else that Ann or Chuck want to add to help people look for stuff here? Well, just that last, um, that last verse, verse 24, which follows what, uh, what you just spoke about, uh, that I, the Lord, will be their God. There's, there's this sense of kind of a reconciliation of the relationship between God and the people as, as well, and that things will, will, will be as they are supposed to be. Yeah. You know, um, kind of the reconciliation that's about to take place. And it's not said blatantly, but it's certainly implied that this is an action that God does on, uh, on the basis of grace, not on the basis that they have earned it or deserved it. And so even in exile, they weren't being faithful followers of God. And so Ezekiel will address that. And so will some, uh, some of the other prophets. But um, this is a wonderful reminder of how God operates on the basis of his grace and uh, the promise that he makes that eventually he's going to bring in the servant David, Jesus, and he's going to do it all that we need. Okay, if there's nothing else, then let's move on to uh, a scripture lesson. Anne, and mm -hmm. First Corinthians. Um. A reading from First Corinthians. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Christ the first fruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. I, I sometimes struggle with Paul, just to let you know. So I, um, I wrote this out, and I would like just to kind of tell it and then turn it over to you guys, and you can tell me if I, how, if I misplaced anything. As I read this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28, I saw some certain things. I saw that um, Paul calls him Christ, and Christ is 
the anointed one, the Messiah, who God set apart to do a particular task. And I see that the resurrection vindicated Christ as God's Messiah. That, set, that proved that he was set apart. Um, somewhere in all of his being set aside, he was ruler over this world. And Christ will rule until the end. Verse 24, it says, then comes the end. So what is the end? The end is a time after which he has destroyed every power and every authority and every ruler. So somehow Christ is going to do that. And the last thing that he is going to destroy is death. At which point Christ, the chosen one, will return the power that God gave him. He will return that power to God the Father. And Christ has put all things under subjection to himself, but he is subject to the Father. And why? So that through this process, God will be all in all. Somehow, though, what God has, God set Jesus to do this, and, but he does it himself. It, um, again, like I say, Paul is, he packs so much in here, but it seems to be an equation then of the Father with the Messiah that they are one and they're going to save humanity. Okay, I'm, like I said, I, Paul gets me a little confused. But one last point. I did see that it related back to what we just talked about in Ezekiel. I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David will be prince among them. That the Messiah is David. He is the prince of the Father and the two of them are one. Okay, you, put your, I do? you did well. <laughs> you, you put your finger on a mystery that okay. is, cannot be explained. And mm -hmm. so that's okay. I, I mean, the Trinity cannot be, we can't get our mind around it. Because how can you say, if some portions of scripture say the Father raised Jesus from the dead, and other uh, uh, scriptures say that Jesus arose from the dead under his own power. And you say, well, how come both, and then God raised Jesus. Well, if Jesus is fully God, Holy Spirit is fully God, and the Father is fully God, then uh, these things go beyond our human uh, brains. And he's, it, it's true, even if we can't quite organize it in our human paradigms and make it fit in those. And so mm -hmm. the fact that the Father, Son, and, and the Holy Spirit are co-equal in the Trinity, we teach that very specifically in our creeds. But at the same time, there is an element that's going to occur when the son is going to be subjected to the father, submissive to the father. And you say, well, wait a minute, how can they be equal? That's our human mind thinking. How can they be equal and have one subject to the other? Mm -hmm. uh, they work that out. <laughs> and they say, because that's the truth. That's the way it is. And, and I would be very suspicious of any pastors or spiritual talkers or lecturers who try to make it clear to you because there's certain things that are just plain mysteries. Mm -hmm. And so be suspicious when someone has an explanation that makes sense according to our human reason, because it may be taking some liberties with the scriptures. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know many people who feel they have to understand it all. Yeah. And then we get to Paul and I think, oh, how do you, I can't, even Peter had trouble with Paul. Yes, you're in good company because Peter says that in one of his epistles. Mm -hmm. and he, some of the stuff that Paul writes about, he doesn't quite get either. Yeah. But if you take it apart, then somehow you can, I, I found with this exercise that somehow I could make the pieces kind of fit together a little bit more, but, but it's, it's so dense and compact. Yeah. And it took a genius to be able to translate these concepts into words to try to get us to understand them 2,000 years later. That's the Holy Spirit. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a divine mystery. And it's, mm -hmm. I've, I, as I get older, I'm more comfortable admitting mm -hmm. that it's a mystery. 
-hmm. and that's as far as I can go with it. You know, mm -hmm. I can maybe draw parallels or analogies, but every analogy limps when you try to compare it to the Trinity because they're in a league of their own. Mm -hmm. Uh, what Paul's doing, it he's kind of explaining the the logic or the the the, the schedule, <laughs> the kind of the eschatological schedule mm -hmm. of how things are going to play out. Um, and part of this um, is how how different the resurrection of Jesus Christ was from the dead, and what what exactly that means. And mm -hmm. and he's kind of fleshing out the implications of Jesus's resurrection here. Yep. Um, so, yeah, Christ, uh, as an animal dies, so also in Christ shall be made alive, but each in his own order. And so this is kind of the order of things as they'll take place. Um, and basically everything, everything is, is, is being summed up um, under God, you know, the Holy Trinity, but, but in, its, in, its, in its particular order. Um, so, yeah, it's, but, but ultimately it is, it is a mystery that um, we'll find out about. Okay, um, I guess we're ready for the gospel. Mm -hmm. So if we turn to Matthew, this is a famous passage from Matthew 25, uh, the sheep and the goats, um, where Jesus... Uh, the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you look after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Again, kind of speaking about the end things, um, this is kind of the time of the year uh, in the church year when we uh, begin talking about that, about that, um, that, that notion. And so when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So here we have, this is where a lot of that imagery comes from, and you'll see it in, in different uh, iconography of the church. Um, Jesus is often depicted sitting on a throne. Um, sometimes at the right hand of the Father. Um, and then before him are gathered all those, uh, all the nations, everybody. Everybody is there before him. And there's a separation that occurs. Um, the, as, a shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, 
And so those who are uh, on, on his right hand, uh, the sheep um, are on his right, the goats on his left. And then the criterion that he gets into, well, why are some on this side and why are some on that side? And here we have the, um, you'll hear this passage sometimes used often uh, about how um, those who are on the right, those who are the sheep, are those who, um, uh, when someone was hungry, they gave them food. Um, they were strangers and you welcomed me naked and you clothed me sick and you visited me. And those who wind up on the left are those who neglected to do those things. And why? Uh, well, uh, those, those who go to, to perdition ask, you know, well, when was it that, that uh, we, we saw you naked or, or hungry or, or sick, Lord? You know, we didn't see you, you know, never did we see, uh, see you in any kind of need like that. And Jesus says, well, as you did to the least of these, my brethren, uh, so you have done to me. Or as you have neglected to do to the least of these, my brethren, so you have neglected to do to me. And so there's this sense, uh, real sense that Jesus communicates here that the, the good things that we do in this life aren't just, uh, they're not just good things for the sake of doing good things, but they're, they actually speak to kind of drawing on our, our reading from last week, our attitude towards God. So if we see a, a neighbor in distress or something like that, and we refuse to help them, well, what does that say about how we, we view Jesus, you know, how we view God? Um, Christ, who uh, gave everything in order to uh, save us, um, and then we, if we're going to take that seriously, that, that gift seriously, well, what does it say about um, the state of our of our souls, uh, our attitude towards God, if we can uh, take that same gift and then just sort of squander it, if you will. Um, or, or if that gift doesn't um, uh, lead towards some kind of change in the way we behave towards one another. Um, it's almost like, well, uh, maybe it didn't really take, Jesus is kind of maybe suggesting here. The, the, the important point, though, is um, I think that Jesus challenges uh, in, this, in this little uh, depiction of, of the Judgment Day, uh, Jesus is challenging how we perceive one another. And, uh, and I think it harkens also to the um, commandment to love one another as, as we love ourselves uh, and to love God with all our heart, body, soul, strength, um, everything that we have. And so, um, and it's a challenge as well. Um, it's a challenge, uh, you know, life isn't simply about um, uh, the um, looking good just for the sake of, of appearances. It's not about appearances. There's, Jesus is um, uh, judging us uh, on the basis of um, uh, kind of, What's what's really going on in, in within our within our hearts within our souls? Um, because it is from that uh, I think that those who are accounted as the sheep um, were were able to uh, to behave as they did, um, as opposed to the so-called goats um, who did not. So um, curious to hear if there are any other thoughts on this one. It's it's a it, it's it's a scene that should give you some something to think about and reevaluate, um, you know, just what it is, uh, what, it, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to, um, uh, you know, to love God and to love our neighbor. Uh, and it's all kind of wrapped up here in this, in this depiction of the judgment. I think what's happened to this parable is what's happened to the Beatitudes. People have turned it into a legalistic, um, math equation. If you do such and such, you'll be blessed, and then you'll get these blessings, and, which is not what he's saying in the Beatitudes. He's saying this is the characteristic of the blessed. Here, there are some really important details, and that's why sequence is really important when you read the scriptures, and especially when you read the parables. What comes first? What comes second? And here in verse um, 32, the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats, 
he doesn't first list all of the qualities of the goats and the sheep before he makes the separation. He does the separating. And then what is said next is really crucial. There are three important details in that verse. He says in verse 34, come you who are blessed by my father. Blessed is a passive blessing or passive gift that they receive because the father has blessed them. They haven't blessed themselves by their behavior and their generosity and all the things that he's going to list. Those are given there for a different reason, I believe. The second uh, thing, inherit the kingdom. Nobody earns their inheritance. Somebody else has to earn the money and the material and the treasure that they leave for the heirs, okay? And then the third thing, this has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so somebody else has put this all together for you, this life everlasting. And what are the evidence markers that show that these are people who have received it in great in grateful faith? Uh, here's all the things that you listed, right, Chuck? And these are the fingerprints of the people who have received God's blessing as a gift of grace, not as something that they have to earn by doing A, B, C, and D. And so it all fits together very nicely with everything else the scripture says about by grace are you saved through faith alone. And here's just another illustration of that. If you're attentive to the details and which ones come first, all of these division were made on the basis of God's uh, grace, not on the basis of people's performance. And those who don't get to be on the right can't say, well, we didn't, what did we do that was so bad? And he'll say, your sins of omission are big enough and serious enough to condemn you if you don't repent of those as well. Mm -hmm. And so not only are you expected to do good things, you're expected not to do certain things. And so, um, and I think th this can be a chilling parable for people as a wake up call to say, are you ready for the king's return? Are you ready for the, the shepherd's return? Um, the way you're, you are ready is by being repentant, by being humble, and by receiving the gifts that he is lavishing on you, not trying to earn it with self-righteous pride. Yeah. So I think everything you said really contributes to that very um, way of looking at this parable. And I think it's a, a valuable reminder at the end of the church year you know, for yeah. us. Those are good details to point out. And oh, sometimes... wait, you said something else before I forget. You, it was really valuable. You, you said they won't even know um, what they didn't do, why they're being condemned. The <laughs> same is said of the people who are put on the right. They weren't keeping track. They said, well, <laughs> when did we do all this good stuff? Because you know? yeah. they're not keeping score, you know, and that's the whole point. And I'm, and I'm always nervous when I was a pastor and our congregation did some nice things. Oh, we ought to put an article in the newspaper and so forth. But there's a stressor that goes on between, uh, in your heart because you say, well, uh, I don't want us to get too dependent upon how the community thinks of us when we decide what we're going to do. Uh, the question should be, what does God want me to do now that he has gifted me? You know, you know. Okay. All righty. Well, we'll uh, stop there for today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks to Tim Carter behind the camera for editing these and uh, putting them out for us. Uh, leave us a like and subscribe and share, and uh, we will see you guys again next week for another episode of Talking Sunday Readings. <laughs>